All right, everybody, welcome back to another edition of From the Other Sideline as TCU sits 7-0 and and looking towards their next opponent, which just so happens to be a trip out east to Morgantown, a place that absolutely no team ever wants to play, especially late in October or beyond, and especially when they're riding high. Um, wouldn't be the first time that West Virginia has shattered the dreams of the Horn Frog faithful, but this is a different looking West Virginia team than, than we have seen in the past. So in order to learn more about the Mountaineers, I reached out to Jake Lance of Smoking Musket, the best and only, as far as I'm concerned, uh, blog about West Virginia football, or at least the only one you need to be paying attention to on social media. Jake, how are things going tonight? Things are going well. It's, it's a tough road for some West Virginia fans, but we're, we're getting through. Well, let's let's start right there. Um, this is a very proud program with a rich and, and important history. Um, TCU fans might only know of the Mountaineers from the Dana Holgerson era on, but this is a program that has enjoyed great success and, and has been a powerhouse um, across multiple conferences and in many ways um, kind of is the partner school to TCU in that regard. But has fallen on a bit of tough times. It looked like the future was bright this season after a, a tough loss to Pitt, but but a game that looked like West Virginia had the pieces that it needed to be successful. But a couple now, you know, halfway through the season, the Mountaineers are, are kind of hovering in that 500 range, have dropped some heartbreakers, and yet bounced up to beat Baylor here recently too. So um, what are your early assessments on this team and where do you fall in the Neil Brown should no longer be employed by the Mountaineers scale at this point in the season? So it, West Virginia right now is a, is worse than the sum of its parts. It, it has the quarterback JT Daniels is a five-star quarterback who has the pedigree having played at both USC and Georgia. It has um a spectacular freshman running back in C.J. Donaldson in complimentary pieces and Tony Mathis and Johnson Johnson. It has Bryce Ford Wheaton, who has shown to be capable of being an NFL-type receiver, 6'4", 220, should be able to high point the ball. Sam James, who has the speed to get by. Caden Prather, who has the ability to high point and take over defenses. So on offense, it has all the pieces. And on defense, it has Dante Steele, the fifth-year senior, whose dad played at West Virginia. It has um, Aubrey Burks on, on the back end. It has Lee Koba, who used to play at Syracuse. So it has pieces that have, that have the talent necessary to be good. And, and you saw that at Pitt, where we were one play away, you know, a fluke. Uh, tip pass turned into an interception pick six um, same thing Kansas we kind of caught Kansas when they were starting to catch fire and um, you know we put points on the board and, and, a, and a poorly thrown pass on the inside on, a, on, a, on an out route turned into a pick six but we were able to come back and beat Baylor um, so they have the pieces and, and unfortunately they are playing below their level of talent um, and as far as that goes, I think that ultimately falls on, on the coach. This is not a one-time thing. This is something that's been going on for now for four years. Um, they just cannot seem to get over that six-win hump. And uh, if you saw me on social media, you know, maybe in the heat of the moment, but probably not really, I, I, I tweeted, leave Neil in Lubbock. And, and honestly, at, at this point, I think, I think it's true. Um, you know, I like Neil. I think when you're talking about a coach and you're talking about what does that coach look like at West Virginia, he checks a lot of the boxes. Good recruiter, um, you know, talks to the supporters. He brings in former players. He's open and honest with the media. He's a family man. He, you know, he it doesn't may, maybe mean as much, but he talks to the Southern draw. He kind of talks like us. He does all of these things two through 100 that a coach is supposed to do. But the number one thing that is a coach's responsibility is to win. And now he sits 20 and 22, 42 games into his tenure, four years into this, what is supposed to be a quote unquote climb. And we, we've never gotten past base camp. We've never started a climb. It's always been one step forward, one step back, two steps forward, two steps back. So, you know, I think at this point, it's a, you haven't won. And the ultimate responsibility of a coach is to win. I think it's ultimately going to cost him his job. You know, you say maybe it doesn't matter that he talks like y'all, but we saw uh, how Brian Kelly was <laughs> quickly changed his <laughs> accent to fit in, so maybe it does. Um, 
You know, I think it's interesting and, I, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on a conference that now has changed over nine of the 10 jobs within the last seven years. Um, Mike Gundy, obviously the longest tenured coach in the Big 12 with Gary Patterson out and um, now Matt Campbell, the second longest tenured coach in the conference, which is crazy to say. Do you think that that seeing success at places like Kansas, obviously what Sonny Dykes is doing at TCU, where you, you could feel the momentum that Joey McGuire is building, what Dave Aranda has done, does that kind of put pressure from the fan base to want to hit a home run? Because like you said, it, it seemed like Neil Brown was a absolute no doubt perfect fit for, for Morgantown, but four years in, the, the change hasn't come, the build hasn't escalated. And so is it the success of some of these other similar programs that have made the fan base kind of light the fire and get his chair a little bit hotter? It, it absolutely has. And I, and I would say seeing, seeing the resurgence of Kansas has probably poured gasoline onto that fire. Um, but seeing places like Texas Tech and Baylor and TCU and um, you know, just in Kansas State, all of who are very similar programs in West Virginia, we're all recruiting around the same general level. We're all in the, the lower 20s to 30s and 40s. You know, we're all at any given point capable of beating anybody and capable of losing anybody because we're all very talented similarly. And so when you look at this and you go, okay, well, if Kansas can get better in year two and TCU can be undefeated in year one and Texas Tech can be uh, four and three and running a hundred plays with a freshman quarterback and, you know, Baylor can go two and 12 and then 11 and two and Kansas state is, you know, slowly every year getting one more or two more wins. You, why can't we, well, it, it can't be because, of COVID and it can't be because he came in and, and there wasn't enough talent. Like there's been enough time and we're seeing that it does, it shouldn't take forever. It shouldn't take four or five, six years because other places are able to do it. I think from a fan's perspective, seeing a place like Kansas who turned over coach after coach after coach and, you know, two wins, three wins, two wins, one win, no win, two win, one win. And then all of a sudden they're at five wins and you're going, you can't tell me that they had a stocked cupboard, that they were just brimming with talent. You know, they were always that, yeah, we might go uh, one and eight in conference, but we're going to beat Kansas. You can't say that now, right? And so when you look at, at these schools that are two through 10 or, or three through 10 in the Big 12, you know, if you take out Oklahoma and Texas, almost everyone else is kind of grouped similarly with their talent. And if you're going – we're falling further behind the rest of the conference. That's a problem. You know, if everyone else is moving at 60 miles an hour and we're moving at 30, we're, we're just falling further and further behind. You brought up JT Daniels earlier. And one of the things that the transfer portal has done is it has enabled schools like West Virginia and, and some of these schools that, you know, aren't the, the big time recruiters that don't get a lot of five-star guys. The UTC you had it with Zach Evans, even though he moved on quickly, but to, to get these, these high level recruits to kind of fall into these non blue blood programs. But it's also very rare that you see a five-star recruit on his third school you know, as a quarterback. And so usually that means that, that there's some talent, but it just hasn't been properly unlocked. Um, he's had some really great moments. He's had some fluky plays that aren't to blame, but it also feels like there, there are some reasons why he's on his third school too. Um, what do you think of, of his fit in the West Virginia offense? And, and he, is he the type of quarterback that could take the Mountaineers over the top? Has he, has he failed to reach expectations because of him or has he failed to reach expectations because the program as a whole has failed to reach expectations? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And it's one that I think we're, a lot of West Virginia fans are struggling with because from a recruiting standpoint, from a talent standpoint, I'd say absolutely. He has every skill necessary to be the guy to take West Virginia to nine, 10, 11 wins. And when you're going, why is West Virginia so good? It should be because JT Daniels is the guy under center. Um, I don't think he has lived up to expectations because I would say a quarterback more than any other position on the football team, his number one job is to make everyone else around him better. I think he has done that with the offensive line. West Virginia's offensive line has been much maligned. Um, last year, it seemed like if you decided to bring more than four people, they were going to not block somebody. And that is not the case this year. 
Um, he has done a great job of calling out protections, calling out audibles, sliding in the pocket, stepping up, stepping back, throwing quickly when needed to, throwing over the top when needed to. Um, but he hasn't raised the level of the receivers. And I think, you know, it's not something you can really explain, but you can see it. You can see it when you watch the NFL and you watch a guy, they call it throwing a guy open. You know, you throw it in a window and that receiver is able to run through a defender into an open space, catch a ball and run. And West Virginia just doesn't do that. You don't see any of these throws where he's throwing through a second or third level window, throwing a guy open or throwing it before the guy breaks and giving his receivers a chance. At the same time, I don't think he's ever been bailed out by his receivers. Uh, you know, I spoke previously about having talent on the receivers, having Bryce Ford Wheaton and Sam James and these guys. But something is missing in the receiver room that allows them to be bigger and better players. They're not fighting for balls. West Virginia is in the top five or ten in contested catches, which, you know, on the surface sounds great. Hey, our guys are winning these balls. But why are they winning? Why are they having to win so many balls? You know, it's one thing if you say, hey, we are tops in, in the league in contested catches at six another when you're in the tops in the league at contested catches at 35 you know there's one so and I don't know that that's the number but it's something along those lines where it's just so many that it's you're going why is it so many it's no longer because the quarterback is is giving his receivers a chance it's more about he his receivers aren't getting separation and aren't giving him easy throws so I think JT has not lived up to the expectations, um, you know, having had Will Greer, having had Geno Smith, having had some of these quarterbacks who were prolific and throwing for three, 400 yards a game. You look at JT and you just kind of go, where's that moment where this guy grabs everyone by the throat and just slings it 50 times and throws for 400 yards and throws four touchdowns. There are flashes, but there's never been anything sustained. It also feels like West Virginia has led the league in drops the last couple of years too. So it's kind of insane to hear that contested catch because it, it well, and, and it's not necessarily sheer volume. It's like drops at the worst possible moment. Um, you talked yeah. about the play against Pitt. I mean, that was a catchable ball that should never have been tipped. And it feels like every year in big spots, you get one or two of those Um I don't, is that a developmental problem within, you know, within the coaching staff? Or is that just, again, not having these guys that, that have the talent, that have the size, that have the speed, but haven't quite put all the pieces together by the time they graduate? Originally, I probably would have said that it's a coaching thing only because it's continued to happen year after year after year. Um, I, but at this point, I honestly don't know. Um, I was talking to some people and thinking about, you know, when I coach baseball and when I coach football and some guys are just natural pass catchers. You know, I can think back that, and I kind of relate it to when I coach baseball, that there are some guys who are, who have never been afraid to feel the ground ball in their life. They get that glove down, they get their, you know, they bend their knees, they, they cradle the ball perfectly. And it doesn't matter if that ball takes a bad hop or not, they are ready for it and always. And then there are other guys who just are anticipating a bad hop and that glove is three inches above the ground and they miss a ground ball when they should because they're thinking about a bad hop and it almost just seems like that's what West Virginia has West Virginia has guys who on paper have all of the skills but just aren't natural pass catchers you know when when I think of Stedman Bailey or Tavon Austin or Kevin White or some of the guys who came through in the past those guys reached out and took the ball out of the air they plucked the ball they were hands catchers you know, and it just, it, it doesn't seem like West Virginia has those. And I don't know how much of that can be taught. You know, you can certainly go out there and catch 10,000 balls off a jug machine, but when the lights come on and you've got a receipt, you got a defensive back, you know, bearing down on you and about to blast you on an eight yard curl route, you sometimes go back to bad habits. And if you're not a good pass catcher, you're just not a good pass catcher. So it seems like it's a, you don't have guys who have the ability to who who don't have great skills at catching the ball, who are then trying to make plays to, you know, who are putting too much mental emphasis on trying to make a play, which then leads to those drops. Well, you know, we we talk about the talent, we talk about the issues, and and I want to talk a little bit about Graham Harrell too in this question. 
But at the end of the day, West Virginia is among the power five points per game leaders. They're, they're putting up almost 35 per game. It's not that this offense isn't scoring. And so I, I'm going to assume that we're going to have some defensive issues we're going to address. But Graham Harrell was another one of those, those people that seems like a good fit. And, and maybe, maybe he still is. What are your uh, kind of early returns on how he's been as an OC and, and the system that he's put in place? Does he just need time or, or is it effective because he is putting up 35 points a game so far? My, my initial thoughts are when he was hired, I thought it was a, another quote unquote home run hire. I was ecstatic for it. Um, you know, West Virginia's offense the first three years uh, under Neil Brown was not very good. Um, I don't know if he was trying to protect a quarterback and line that were below average at the time. Um, Harrell is definitely capable of producing points, and he has. Um, if you look at the box scores recently, you'll start to notice a, a decrease in the points per game. Um, Baylor's a little bit of an outlier because you see 43 and you think, okay, you know, they're back on track, they're scoring. Nine of those points were on the defense. They returned a fumble for um, a touchdown and they blocked a, a, an extra point, returned that for two points. They also intercepted a ball and I think we, we were, you know, on the 10 yard line or something to that effect. So it was another really easy score. Um, but hey, so but, but don't don't worry. You're not going to hear from PCU fans about advantages and playing a backup <laughs> quarterback. I promise you're not going to get any of that from me because we know how that's been for the Horn Frogs. So I, I do think um, he has improved the offense. And from where it was last year to where it is this year, it's night and day. So uh, we're very happy with that. Um, it's very tough to know now, you know, coming off of the Texas Tech loss, they're there seemed to be a disconnect in what they wanted to do. One of the things that West Virginia fans have been wanting to get back to is that long, deep pass, throwing it down the field, getting some chunk plays. We started to see that at Pitt. We saw that against Kansas, and that has started to kind of taper off um, in the last few games. And again, is it talent? Is it trying to scheme because of a uh, – you know, offensive line or, or you don't believe in, in certain players. So I, we're, we saw a lot and a lot and a lot of screens against Texas Tech. And we're not seeing those deep throws and those deep plays to, okay, well, instead of needing to go 10, 11, 12 plays, we can go score in three plays. And I think that is what is what's missing. So Right now, I'm happy with Harrell. I, you know, I, I think he will continue to get better. I think back to when Dana first came on that first year in the Big East was not very good. You know, I think the offense ranked in the 60s, and, um, you know, it wasn't lighting up defenses. But a year later, when we came over to the Big 12, they were – it was 49, 50, 55, 60 points. You know, and it may just be something where, hey, one more year and you see the fruition of, of all this uh, talent and, and practice that, that's gone into it. It is pretty crazy to put over 30 offensive points up against the Dave Aranda defense and they come back and only manage 10 against Texas Tech. But I guess that's part of the, the complaints from West Virginia fans is that inconsistency. Um, you yeah. have those flashes where you see, oh, we can do some things. And then you have those games where – everything falls apart and obviously playing at home versus playing on the road. And Lubbock is very rejuvenated with, with McGuire at the, at the helm. Um, I, I'll tell you, I'd feel a lot better about this game if it was in Fort Worth and it being in Morgantown based on, on how, how the Mountaineers have played at home still. Um, let's talk about the defense a little bit. You know, TCU obviously is another one of those explosive offensive attacks. Um, and I think the thing that has pleasantly surprised TCU fans coming off of the previous coaching regime is the adjustments that, that this program is able to make now, both on the offensive and defensive end. And so you mentioned Dante Stills, obviously one of the most feared pass rushers um, in the country. And, and everyone outside of Morgantown was disappointed when he announced he was coming back for another year. Um, but, but outside of that, what, you know, what do you think that West Virginia is doing well on defense? And then where did they really get exploited by Texas Tech and, and Pitt and some of the other teams that had managed to, to pour on the points and, and upset them? So Neil Brown's philosophy has always been he wanted to be a team that could run the ball and could stop the run. And West Virginia has done that. In the last four years, they have always been a really good run defense team. 
Um, and even right now, I think they're t- they were before you did wouldn't really know it against Texas Tech, but before they were a really good run defense team. They were top twenty five limiting teams to right around 100 yards or so and under four yards of carry. Um, and, you know, a lot of that comes down to their defensive line. They've made a concerted effort to get bigger and have more mass on the defensive line to, to make teams have to devote more offensive linemen to them, that therefore freeing up everybody else. Uh, the transfer portal hit West Virginia really hard in the back end. It stole several players. And so they were forced to, to find new players um, through who were either F- FCS or um, G5 talents, and they were looking for guys who had starter experience. They didn't want to get backups on the P5 level. They wanted guys who had played previously. Uh, their goal was to find guys who were bigger, longer, and faster, hoping to play more man. But something's going wrong on, on the secondary, whether it's just so many new pieces who are un unable to play at the at the division one level who are unfamiliar with the defensive scheme or how it's being taught the secondary has just been a dumpster fire they are confused at the start they are not covering guys um you started to see it against texas tech i thought against pitt i thought against kansas i thought against towson and virginia tech the the secondary was was okay. You know, there were there were moments that happened. They're young kids. It's a new scheme. You know, first, second, third game of the year. Those things happen. But then against Texas, you, you started noticing that hey, Texas is running a three by one set, and we've got two defensive backs on the wide side where they've got three receivers. We've got three guys on the short side where they've got one receiver. Like something's going wrong here. We're not we're not audibling right. We're not we're not covering right. And you started to see just really big lapses and really big bust in coverage. Um, and I thought Texas Tech was kind of the, the, the perfect storm in that aspect. They go really fast, which puts a lot of pressure on the defense to, to begin with. They throw the ball a ton, which is the, the thing that West Virginia can't do. And they go for it on fourth down, which then just wears your defense out. So you started to just kind of see the heat, the wind, the, the throws, the speed, the consistently going for it, knowing that, hey, we got to stop. It was third and 10. We stopped them. It's fourth and four. And Texas Tech is like, I don't care. You know, it, it's just another play for us. That really just started to wear on them. And you could kind of see that that towards the end where they were just, they were worn out. Uh, Texas Tech ran over 100 plays on them. And it just really kind of, that's a lot. You know, that's a lot for anybody. That's a lot for defense. Um And so that's the one thing that worries me against TCU. I think if TCU tries to run, you play into the the hands of West Virginia. They would love to get into one of these three cloud, three yards in a cloud of dust uh, games. But if teams come out here and say, we're going to motion, we're going to go tempo and we're going to throw the ball, West Virginia is in for a world of hurt. Yeah, I think that's what's going to be really interesting is, you know, we've seen TCU go to the air and with Clinton Johnston and Jared Wiley now emerging and, you know, Darius Davis, Tay Barber. I mean, they certainly have the weapons. We saw them against Kansas State kind of alter the game plan and give a heavy dose to Kendra Miller. I think Max only threw, Doug only threw the ball 26 times. And so it sounds like this is going to be a game where Sonny Dykes and, and uh, Garrett Riley are going to come out looking to throw the ball deep. Um, and depending on what the weather forecast is for Morgantown on Saturday, that could certainly play. Uh, be, be a be a bad thing for for the Mountaineers. Um, we I don't know how much you've had a chance to watch TCU this year, but is there anybody in particular that that you know considerably worries you offensively, or is there a player that you think defensively um, is going to have an advantage and make a difference in this game? So I haven't had a chance to watch a lot, but I do remember Max Duggan from from last year. Um, and I just I remember always thinking this is a guy that if he ever put it together is going to be special. And, and that's one that I've, I've kind of watched, you know, I'm quickly looking up his stats and seeing a guy who has 19 touchdowns to one interception kind of scares me. Um, and he was one that, that I always thought if you guys could just figure, if he could figure it out, if the light came on for him, he was going to be a special guy. And that's what it looks like for us. Yeah, and I think that the one interception too was a was a hail mary at halftime against Kansas. So he hasn't thrown like an in game 
devastating drive killing pick um, so far this year, which uh, is, is, you know, certainly been a difference maker. Um, I think him and I think Quentin Johnston um, was pretty quiet. You know, Kansas state has a, a six foot four cornerback, but he's been a, he's a, he's an NFL, like a first round talent. Um, one of those, one of those guys that can do some things. Um, would you think about Saturday? Um, you know, I think a morning kickoff is, is a good thing for the frogs. I think it saves them a little bit yeah. too. Um, playing in Morgantown at night is the absolute worst. Um, but is, is there, uh, do you have a feel for the game? Do you think that, you know, this team obviously coming off the big win against Baylor and pulling off that upset, but then going and kind of laying an egg in Lubbock, getting back home, is, is that going to give them the refresh? Are they, are they playing to save Neil Brown's job? Or do you think that this is a team that's kind of on the precipice of if they get down early, they may pack it in? Like, what's the, what's the culture around the program right now? And how's that going to impact the way that they play Saturday? Uh, I would say the, the the best thing I can say about Neil Brown right now is that the team hasn't quit on him. You know, even at three and four, he still seems to have the locker room. Those guys still really love him. Um, I do think coming home is going to be rejuvenating for the team. I think it's homecoming. Um, you know, weirdly enough, Neil Brown is undefeated against TCU. He's never lost to him. Um, you know, you've got a team that certainly is going to hear about how poorly they played and, and how much his job is on the line and how, you know, you've got Dante Steeles, who's a super senior, and this is his last year and, and all of those things coming out. So I can certainly see the team coming out and playing hard. Um, and I, I don't think if they get down early that they're going to, to give up that, that, that hasn't been their MO. They are certainly a team that fights, you know, they like to say that they won the, the second half against te Texas, even though they were down 28 to seven going into half. Um, and I think if they can keep it close, it's one of those where, hey, OK, you know, hey, just just make this adjustment and get things going. One big play could be a spark. You know, my my gut feel kind of says that playing the current number seven team in the nation at 12 against what is probably not going to be a sellout crowd. Um, the weather looks like it's going to be pretty decent. It doesn't look like it's going to be rainy and cold and miserable for anybody. Thank God. <laughs> I think a lot of that plays into TCU's favor. Um, so, you know, if I had to pick or if I had to think, I think TCU's, fa you know, favored and, and I would certainly expect them to be. Um, I think it'll probably be a little bit closer than, than you want to initially. It's hard to say what's going to happen at the end. I could see pressing and, and JT Daniels throwing, you know, desperation throws that, that get picked off and lead to a, a further score. Could also see if you guys were smart. And if I were Sonny Dykes, I would motion, I would go tempo. I would throw the ball 175 times this game and never run the ball once um, and take my chances because I think that's the easiest and best way to beat West Virginia. Um, I doubt you guys will want to do that. I doubt you guys will want to try and throw it that much. Um, but I, I think TCU's favored right now. I, I think West Virginia is going to play hard. And, you know, as long as you don't pull a Baylor and turn it over multiple times and get a blocked extra point and, and a bunch of other things, I think you're, you're in the driver's seat. So uh, hope and pray Morgantown madness doesn't happen. Well, it's a, it's a six and a half. Uh, TCU's given six and a half right now, which is a little bit I mean, again, you would think it's a little bit low for a top 10 team and a, a three and four team, but at the same time, like you said, it's Morgantown. So crazy things happen. So less than a touchdown dog. Um, if, if West Virginia is able to pull off the upset, who was your offensive D uh, MVP and who was your defensive MVP? If West Virginia pulls off the offset, uh, the upset, it's probably CJ Donaldson, who is their, their freshman quote unquote tight end, who is now a running back. Um, he was injured against, Baylor. He, he, he had a concussion. Um, he ended up running a whole lot more than they really wanted to against Texas Tech. Um, but when he was healthy against Pitt, he put up 125 yards in his first career collegiate game. He put up another 100 yards against Kansas. I mean, we're talking about a big guy, 6'2", 220, you know, running a 4'4", who, who puts his foot in the ground and runs north and south and doesn't go down on arm tackles. You know, he's willing to dish out some punishment because he was a tight end. He's got some hands. They're not afraid to throw, throw, um, you know, out of the backfield and give him a slip screen or, you know, a flare and let him put his foot in the ground and try and get six, seven, eight yards on, on a pass. So I think if he gets back to controlling the line of scrimmage and, and generating positive yards in the run game, 
he would be my MVP. I could see him easily going for 110, two touchdowns, catching the ball five, six, seven times, you know, 30 yards or whatever, and just kind of controlling and keeping West Virginia in the game. Um, defensively, I think it's going to be Dante Stills. You know, if he has a big game, he's going to be the guy who generates everything on that defense. Uh, one of my criticisms has been Dante has been great. And, and it, it's tough to say that because I think he has something like 16 or 17 um, tackles for loss right now, but he's not getting any help. You know, he has double digits and then the next guy has six. So he, he oftentimes does things that don't show up on a stat sheet. There will be a lot of times where he'll split a double team, move the quarterback and the next guy will, miss a tackle and the quarterback runs for six or seven yards. And that should have been a sack or that should have been a tackle for loss. But if Dante has a big game, if you continue to hear his name called, uh, he's absolutely going to be a force for us. And I could see where that could turn the tie for him. And if you're willing to do it, you, are you willing to put a prediction, put a prediction out there for everybody to hold you accountable to? Sure. Why not? Um, I'll go a bit Homer. I think this this is going to be closer than we think. I think TCU covers. I mean, I think if most, you ask most fans today coming off the Texas Tech loss, we're probably thinking another, you know, 38 to nothing. They're, they're, they're fatalistic and thinking we're never going to win another game. But I'm thinking more something kind of along the lines, 38-24. I think TCU covers and, and they win, but I think it's going to be a whole lot closer. I think maybe you kind of pull away in the end, but and West Virginia really, you know, puts up a good fight in this one. Well, if there's one thing we know about TCU, it's that they're going to allow points. You're going to score on that for the most part in the first half, and then you're not going to do a whole lot in the second half. That's been the, kind of their MO the last couple of weeks. So I don't know if that'll be the same. That'll be true. That's, you know, we've only seen them on the road once, and, and Kansas with their backup quarterback kind of kind of went off. So who, who knows what to expect. They haven't had a road game in a while. Um, Jake, thanks so much for taking some time and, and chatting with us today. Where can people find you and your work? So I am on uh, Smoking Musket. You can find me. I usually write three, four articles a week. You can find me on Twitter at Nightstare. Um, I'm all over the place. I will respond to anybody. Uh, I may be gruff because we're not having a great season, but we can certainly have a conversation. So uh, come find me and, and come read. Well, we are we are uh, learning what it's like to be on the end of gruff fan bases for the first time in a long time <laughs> over at TCU. Uh, lots of salty folks in the mentions here the last couple of weeks, but yeah, I guess I guess that comes with the territory. Um, <laughs> I, I will say I think the the kinship between TCU and West Virginia is coming in together into the Big Twelve. Um, I'd still say the absolute best tailgating experience I've ever had outside of Fort Worth was in Morgantown, and honestly, it's probably a little bit better than TCU's. I, I had an absolute blast out there, and a game where you know the first play of the game. Came Kenny, Kenny uh, Hill threw a pick six. So still had a great time. <laughs> had a great time. So uh, I, I think this is going to be a crazy one. It's going to be fun. Again, I think we're really, really lucky that, that we're getting the, the noon Eastern kickoff and not the, the 8 p.m. Eastern kickoff. But uh, you can't take anything for granted when you play West Virginia, no matter what the circumstances. So uh, I think we'll have a good one. Um, thanks so much for, for talking West Virginia with us. And, and I, I know I'll be looking forward to, to an entertaining game because TCU and West Virginia don't play many games that aren't entertaining. I'll say certainly don't. Thanks for having me.